Good evening. We'll be singing two songs here to open the service. So you'll be turning your Zion's praises to number 10. Number 10. Five hundred thirty three. Five hundred thirty three.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It is a privilege to be able to welcome you all in the name of Jesus. Blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. And uh, thank you for Curvin for leading those songs, very fitting. Well, thank you for coming. I'm glad to see it this full. I'm glad to see the families here and uh, many teachers, probably all of you are here. I'm not going to try to look for the one that might be missing. And I'm glad to see the student body here, especially the high schoolers, those that have their driver's license. You may be here against your will, but I'm glad to see you here. It's a blessing to see your interest in education, something you put so much time into. I was thinking tonight about how much truth is spoken into my life, and I think we could all say this, with our church services and our schools and our, just our community, there is a lot of truth spoken into our lives, and yet we show up here for more. And um, how is this different than church? I'm not sure. I think it's nice to have an educational meeting in this venue. Um, what all happens here, if you don't visit school or get back here very often, when you do come back, you probably leave the same way I do, just kind of overwhelmed with what all happens here in one day's time. And the many moving pieces and the schedules and how much is put into making things flow. It's, it, it's phenomenal, the work that goes into it. And we all play a small part in that. And so it's good for us to get together and hear a topic on Christian education. One of the things that come up tonight, just the board was back there talking about, how do we ever get to a Sunday night? I'm not sure. If maybe we should take a community poll again and see if people think it suits better on a Sunday night or a Friday night. But I had this thought, and I didn't share it with them, but I'll share it now. Um, I really think the same people show up about every time. It doesn't matter what night you have it on. It, you need to make it a priority. It's just how it works. And I realize there's conflicting plans. but So it's good to come here and hear something centered on education. Tonight we have Jeff Rhodes with us. And he is from, originally I believe, Columbiana, Ohio. I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, teaches school at Berea Christian School, has been teaching there. He's in his seventh year. And I think it's good to come back here and hear an educational talk from someone that's in the trenches. And um, even from a different community, because he can share stories that we don't know the people quite as well, maybe, and we can relate to them. So um, we're glad he's here. Um, I asked him, I'm not sure how long ago, and he consented, and so we're glad God blessed our plans. And so before we start, before I turn it over to Jeff, let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift that you have given to us in Jesus, that he has saved us and bought us and delivered us and has given us life, set us apart, and we thank you for that. Thank you for grace in our lives to live for you. And thank you for the vision that people that have gone before us had for Christian education and for the platform that they've given us to build on. Help us to be faithful in doing that. And again, we thank you tonight that you've blessed our plans and that Jeff can be here to share with us. I just pray that you would give him your spirit as he shares your message to us. And clarity of thought, just bless him for this and all of us as we listen and learn more of you and how we ought to live. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you, Jeff. Good evening and welcome to this service, even though I say that as a visitor, but I feel like something it's appropriate to say from the outset, I guess. Um, it is a privilege for me to be here. Um, yeah, it's a privilege. I can't say that I'm looking forward to it, but it is a privilege, and I, I, uh, I'm glad to be here to, to share with you. Uh, I am Jeffrey Rhodes. I am from Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, <clears throat> I, I teach high school at Berea. I also um, teach music to 7th and 8th grade a couple times a week. So on a daily, on a, on a daily basis, I get to interact with uh, 
40 to 60 students. Um, it's a completely different setting from what I was used to growing up, but it's, it's really great. I've, I've, really, uh, I've really learned, um, learned to appreciate it and enjoy it, uh, interacting with that number of students. Um, I enjoy teaching mostly. Um, the, the, I enjoy the social part more, not, not partying, but I, 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 I teach for the joy of interacting with young people, and I, it's very, it, um, teenagers have a very special place in my heart, I guess you could put it that way. So, um, <clears throat> I grew up in Ohio, moved to Virginia to teach. Um, <clears throat> I, I am a bachelor. I live by myself. I don't say that as a way to advertise myself, but um, I live by myself. Uh, it's, it's really, it's a great life. Um, if you'd come to visit me, you'd, you'd find in my kitchen an exercise bike and bathroom scales. If you'd go into the dining room, you'd find an office desk. If you'd go into the living room, you'd find office chairs uh, for my furniture. So things are mixed up in my house, but I, I have my little den there, and it's, uh, it's really great. Anyway, <clears throat> the, the topic for tonight is teaching our children to surrender. Um, when Keith asked me to, to give this topic, um, I, I, I said yes. I, I really didn't know why. It was one of those things I really had no reason to say no, so I was like, well, let's... let's uh, Sure, I'll do it. And he told me that you can speak on whatever you feel led to. And uh, I, I, I arrived at this, um, I arrived at this, and as I started to come up with it and, and put it together, I realized that there's um, stuff in here about uh, child raising and things like that, and I, I fully recognize the irony of, of a single guy standing before a bunch of parents and counseling them on how to raise their children, but uh, it's the Holy Spirit working through me. What else am I supposed to do? Um, I do, I do, uh, yeah, I am not a parent, but I do interact every day with 40 to 60 teenagers. Um, that has to account for something. So, uh, yeah, what I, what I present to you tonight, I do out of humility. I, just as observations, largely from my own life in, in, living the Christian life and seeing, seeing how, seeing how uh, surrender is necessary in every part of life. I want to uh, introduce the topic, to introduce the topic, I want you to think about if I had a picture in front of you and I would ask you on this picture would be a graduate from Horizon School. Is it Horizon or Horizons? Horizon, okay. Uh, from Horizon School, what would that graduate look like? And I'm not talking physical appearance. I'm talking what, what skills would they need to have? Um, what character traits should they have? How much responsibility should they be able to carry? How much responsibility should an 18-year-old man have? Uh, it probably is too much to, to probably ordain him as a preacher. What about teaching Sunday school? Leading song leading? Um, <clears throat> should he be able to get out of bed in the morning without his mother waking him up? I don't know. What, what should this graduate look like? When you would speak to this graduate, what would they talk about? What is your view of success for your child as, as they come from school and you are, you, we're, we're trying to set them up for, for life, what would you what would you define as a successful graduate from this school? And would that picture look anything different from what the world um, puts forward as their ideal graduate, as their ideal young person? 
our graduates should look different from the rest of the world. Not necessarily in somewhat in skill, but they should look different with the, the, the goals that they have for life. They should look different in how they present themselves. They should be different in what they speak about. They should, the character, their character traits should be far different from what the world has to offer. Sometimes I think about as we, as we have, we pulled out from the public education system, it seems like we have the same goals that, we have the same goals that the world has, we just do it in a Christian setting. And I, I just want to challenge you with the thought, Will we be able to take the goals of the world and sugarcoat them in a Christian setting and actually turn out something different from what the world is turning out? Or is our approach to education going to have to be something different and have to include something that is, that is contrary to what the world makes sense of? Is there going to have to be an element of our education that is, that's included in our education that is way different from the world? And that's why I arrived to my topic tonight, is that in our education, one, the, the fundamental of our education has to be surrender. Brokenness before God. Brokenness to authority. If we do not have that, if we do not, if we do not have that in our young people, a sense of brokenness, humility, a desire to do what's right, and we have, that we're, we have completely failed in our education system. I don't care if Horizon's turning out the smartest students, the most skilled, the most able, bright, quick with their mind, being able to discern world affairs, if they're not broken, it's worthless. And those things that we have actually taught them, if they are not broken, will actually be, they will actually use them to their own detriment and will actually become something that becomes a burden to them, not a help. So we have to make sure our focus is correct as we are, as we are approaching as we, are, as we are sending our children to school, we have to make sure that our focus is in the right place. And it's in the heart. And even further than that, it's on their life. We need to be training our children how to surrender. And I'm not here to give you a bunch of, a bunch of disciplinary methods tonight on how much you should spank your children or whether um, grounding your teenagers is a good idea or not. That's not my point. My point is going to focus more on how are you living your own life as a follower of Jesus Christ. And if your child were to model your life, would they turn into the type of broken and humble Christian that we want our young people to become? Both, we are, we are of a separate kingdom. Both kingdoms, we have a lot of things that we do not have in common. But one thing we do have in common is we honor those who have given everything for a greater cause. The world honors our military, our soldiers, our police officers. During the pandemic, it was the, it was the people in the medical field. They were sacrificing everything. <clears throat> they were sacrificing everything including their own safety, for a greater cause, to take care of other people. Soldiers on the battlefield throw their life, throw their lives in front of enemy fire to promote a cause that they care about, but that is a cause that is far greater than them, that most people won't even know what they did. And, and the world honors those people. 
Yes, we like the people who are skilled, the LeBron James, Mike Trout, but those people don't receive the honor and the, and the, and the exaltation that those who have given their lives for their country have. The same is in our own kingdom. We serve a different king, but those who receive the most, the highest honor in our kingdom should be that we have sacrificed our lives for the cause of Christ. Are you living a life that reflects, and I'm talking to you as parents and teachers, are you living a life that actually reflects that you care about the kingdom's values on giving up everything, or do you, are you living a life that shows that you are caring more about the world's view on giving up everything? We honor those. The greatest honor on, the, on earth goes to those who have given up everything for a greater cause. We do it for a completely different reason. We do it for no glory. We do it for, for God himself, completely removed of ourselves and alive unto Jesus Christ. That is our purpose here in this kingdom. And as we are teaching our children, we need to make sure that we are passing that on to them. And that comes from, that comes from, that, that, that includes things far beyond school life. School is just a very small, very small sliver of the whole educational pie here. The home is, is hugely important in this, the church. We need to teach our children to surrender. <clears throat> want to, want to, for our first scripture reading, look at Matthew 22, verse 37. <clears throat> A lawyer came to Jesus and asked him, Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Every command that you'll find in Scripture, these two commands, everything else hangs on these that we give everything for God and love our neighbor as ourself. There is no self in these verses. There is none. That is, those are the two greatest commands. That is our calling. It doesn't matter where you stand on what type of covering is, is more non-conformed, uh, what type of dress. If these two things, if you are missing these in your life, the rest of it's worthless. The rest of it is worthless. Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there, shall some stand, there, sh there be some standing here which shall not taste of death, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is a concept that the world does not understand but is very fundamental to the Christian life. Those who do not lose their life, those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The only, uh, the only place of truth, the only, uh, when we have arrived to lasting fulfillment will only be through death to ourselves and alive to Jesus Christ. Where there's, where there's things for God or things for others. If our work is to be fulfilling, it's going to take death to ourselves, lasting fulfillment. Parents, if your marriages are going to be fulfilling, it's going to take a lot of death to yourself. If our relationships with our people at church are going to have any type of lasting fulfillment, it's going to be through death to ourselves, 
Not what the other person has to offer for us. Not what God is doing for us. It's death to ourself. And we are cheating our children out of a life of fulfillment if we teach them anything else other than that. That they can somehow attain some, they can somehow in, uh, attain some for, some for fulfillment through any other means other than dying to themselves, surrendering themselves for a greater cause. <clears throat> we somehow have gotten to this idea that if we, if, we, if we find the perfect spouse, if we get the perfect job, if we find the perfect church, that somehow things are going to be easy for us and it's going to be a great life. And it's just not true. The only fulfillment we have, the only lasting fulfillment, sin offers a little bit for a short time. Any lasting fulfillment, we're going to have to die. Paul says, I die daily. It's a continual process. <clears throat> God is in all things. I believe that anything that we do, we are interacting with God in some way. Anything we do requires us to surrender to something and surrender indirectly through that thing to God. Anything that we do. Whether it's our work, whether it's dealing with other people of the world, whether it's dealing with people in our churches, whether it's facing life situations, everything requires that we be surrendered and doing it for something beyond ourselves. In order to be effect effective, we have to view life through those lens. Whether you're on school board, you are serving God in your work on school board. As a teacher, you are serving God. When you are interacting with people at your church, you are interacting with God. And we have to approach life with that mindset. I want to look at the various areas that we have to be surrendered to God and, and look, at how we can, look at how we can try to pass that on to our children. Some of these things we could say, well, you're splitting hairs and separating them. But I believe, I believe that it's helpful to split this up and to look at it and, and ask ourselves, how am I doing in this specific area? <clears throat> Uh, our government is split into equal branches. And I believe God's authority is very much the same way. It's different types of God's authority. Each of us, each, each, in each branch, we're required to do two things. We're required to carry out the expectations of that responsibility in that authority and do it with an honor toward people or do it with an attitude of honor toward God. There's two things in everything that we do that require that, I believe. Is there's a set of expectations laid out that we have to obey and we have to do it with a heart of sincerity towards the person we are doing it for or do it with a heart of honor toward God. The first is we need to be surrendered to the will of God. And I'm speaking more specifically of the permissive will of God. This is when God allows difficult things into our lives that we do not understand, we do not appreciate. They hurt. They cause distress. But God allows them for a greater purpose in our life to bring us closer to him, to teach us lessons about ourselves, to teach us where we have to become more broken. I want to look at Job. Turn to Job 2. God is having, having a meeting with his angels. And Satan comes along, and the Lord's like, what are you doing here? Uh, and, Satan, and Satan's like, well, I've been going along, I'm on going to and fro on the face of the earth. And God, almost as a, as a joke, was like, uh, he's like, have you considered my servant Job? He says, there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And Satan's like, the only reason Job serves you is because you do good things for him and you have a hedge of protection about him. All right? He's not serving you and loving you because of who you are as God. He's, he's just doing it because you're giving him good gifts. And God's like, all right, take everything away from Job 
You're not allowed to touch his life. That's it. And Satan did that, and God allowed it to happen to Job. And he lost his servants, he lost his cattle, he lost all of his children. And at the end of that, it says, Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down on the ground and worshipped God and said, Naked came, out of my, came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This was a man who lost everything except for his wife and his health. And he kneeled down and worshipped God. <clears throat> Satan came back to God. And God's like, okay, how did it go? You see, Job, I have allowed you to do everything that you could to him except take his life and touch him. And he still holdeth his integrity and looks to me. And Satan said, skin for skin, yea, all that is a man hath, he will give for his life. Let me touch him. And I will prove to you that Job will give up you after he has experienced this. And God said, okay, you can touch him, but you're not allowed to take his life. So Satan did, and Job was covered with boils. But he still, it says there, Job sinned not against God in all of this. As we are faced with situations in life where, where, it, is not, where it is not ideal, where it, where it Harm where God allows things that come in to harm our reputation or, or whatever, whatever it is. Job with these boils probably had to sit on the ground naked and scratch himself with a broken piece of pottery. This was a respected man who was relegated to that. And he turned not against God. When we are, when we are required, when God asks of us to give up something we do not want, for a greater cause. Are we willing to give that over to God? <clears throat> In James 1, verse 2, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. I'm sorry, I read one verse too far. The trying of our faith is for a greater cause. Are we counting it joy? And are we actively looking for the good of the, in the situations that God has placed us in? And this requires, this requires, this is where God, there, there, this is where there's reasons why God teaches us to be thankful. Can we look at the situations that we're in and say, you know what, I'm grateful that I'm here right now. And, as we, and, and the, where, the part where we pass this on to our children is we have to talk about these situations with our, with our children, with our young people, in that light, that we are counting it joy, that we are not taking this victim mentality towards life, that woe is me. Here is something else that we have to face. Why is God doing this to us? Life is not fair. And that is one thing we have to establish in our children, that life is not fair. But one, the, the more important part of that is it is often not fair in our favor. It is not fair that children in Africa are lucky if they have a shirt to clothe themselves. I teach consumer math class, and I make everybody take a record of all the clothes that they have. And it's incredible how much we have Life isn't fair. That's not fair. But it's fair in our favor. It is not fair that today you had three meals to eat and they were all good. That's not fair. There are some people that didn't have any. There are some people that had only one and it was rice. That's not fair. And we have to recognize that. And, and for you students that are here, as you're in school and you're in this battle with who has the nicest clothes and who's more skilled and whatever who's more musically inclined, you have to recognize that, yes, it might not be fair that you have been dealt this lot in life or you're sh too short or whatever, but life for you is not fair, and it is, too fa it is not fair in your favor. 
comparatively speaking, to everybody else in the world. And we have to approach, our, we have to approach life with this idea that we have it good, and we have to be grateful for what we have. <clears throat> Job did not lift up accusation against God. He questioned God. He was tried, and Job wrestled with a lot of things. But he never lifted up, he never says, or he never sinned against God with his lips. Another story to, to, to prove this point, that our situations do not have to take away our joy, that we can find joy through the giving up of ourselves for a greater cause. During World War II, there was a doctor that was, he was a prisoner, he was a psychiatrist, Dr. Overmeyer. As he was in the barracks, as these prisoners were facing terrible things, brutal things, they were starting to go insane. And he was a psychiatrist, so of course he's the one that should have this figured out how to help them. And he tried everything he knew how to do to help his fellow prisoners, and it didn't work. Insanity was reaching levels incredibly high. Uh, <clears throat> in history, I think World War II was the highest rate of suicide amongst, uh, amongst people groups in those camps. Prisoners were committing suicide to get away from their situation. These were, these were, this was the epitome of a brutal life. And I don't know, somehow these barracks communicated amongst themselves through some for prison underground communication. And he heard word of another, of another camp where there was another doctor that was having the same problem with his prisoners, but he was telling his prisoners this, that if they wish to retain their sanity, they, that this prisoner, these prisoners must devote himself entirely, all of his physical, mental, and spiritual energies into helping other people. And in this man's barracks, where, these, where he was dealing with this, these prisoners, they were to the point where there was no insanity, and they were actually finding some sense of happiness in the life they were living. That's incredible. But it came through one thing. Entirely getting rid of self and focusing on the cause of others. And Dr. Overmeyer heard about this and tried it in his camp and brought the levels of insanity down to most zero. We need to somehow, we need to instill that in our own life. I need to instill that in my own life. But we need to work to instill that within our children that, yes, the only way for you to be happy through these difficult times, you, you, you're having all kinds of drama, whatever, is serve others. Serve others. <clears throat> we need to be surrendered to the call of God in our life when God calls us. I would invite you to look at the story of Moses, Exodus 3. God comes to Moses and speaks to him through a burning bush. God shows himself in a mighty way to Joseph. <clears throat> Exodus 3, verse 10, he says, and he's talking to Moses through a burning bush. He says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth thy people and the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses has a very normal response. Who am I that you are calling that I should go to Pharaoh and I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he goes on to the next rest of the chapter and and. Ask again in verse 10. He says, Lord, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak. <clears throat> I am slow of speech and of slow tongue. God was asking Moses to go back to the place where he murdered an Egyptian. Not a smart idea. That's why Moses was in the desert for 40 years. So Moses looks at, looks at this situation. God's calling him to do something. And he's saying, God, why me? This, this is a bad idea. Notice God's response in verse 12 of chapter 3. God doesn't say, well, Moses, I've, been, I've had you in this wilderness for 40 years. I've been testing you. I've been preparing you to be the leader in the, of, of, these, of my special people. Um, all of these things in life that I, that I have done, I have been preparing you. You are qualified and ready to go. No, he didn't say that. He says, I will be with you. The end. We need to have that level of trust when God calls us. 
that God is calling us not because of our own abilities, and that it is not of our own abilities that we are going to be able to attain anything, but it is God working through us. God will be with us. In this section, Moses had a problem with surrender. Moses was a great man, far greater than I will ever become. He had done great things for God. But Moses had a problem with surrender. If you look at chapter 4, uh, verse 11, God's like, Well, who hath made man's mouth? Who, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have I not? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And Moses, kind of like, All right. O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand whom thou shalt send. Basically, I'll do it if you make me. And notice the response in verse 14. It says, God was angry with Moses for this type of attitude toward God. I'll do it if you make me. Young people, teenagers, as you are relating with your parents, that is not a proper response to your parents. Yeah, I'll do it because you're asking me to do it. That's it. It wasn't acceptable in God's eyes, and it's not an acceptable response to your parents either. <clears throat> God was calling Moses. He had a reason for what he was doing. Moses' job was to say, yes, Lord, I'll do it. And do it with trust, not with a smart aleck attitude. Young people, that's, our response. that's your responsibility to your parents too. Yes, Dad. I don't understand why you're making this curfew at 10 o'clock. It's ridiculous, but I'll do it. And it's not with a cast off attitude of, I'm only doing it because you're asking me to do it. You need to do it with honor and graciousness to your father. And there's other things that apply there too. And it applies with all of us as we are relating to our authority. We don't just do things just because the preacher says or because the police officer pulled us over. It's an attitude of respect. It is not acceptable to be a smart aleck. And God and Moses experienced that here with God. Gideon, we were just discussing in our Sunday school lesson, Gideon faced the same thing. God called him. And Gideon's like, who am I? I'm, I'm my father's family was poor. I'm the least in my own father's poor house. And God gave him the same response. Certainly I will be with you. That's all we need. It's not on our ability. We need to respond to the call of God, even when it, we don't understand and we don't feel qualified to do so. There's also other areas we need to respond to the call of God in our life. When the Holy Spirit works in us to prompt us to speak a word of encouragement or, or, or go talk to somebody to witness, we need to be responsive to that as well. And our children are watching us, parents. Our children are watching us. How are they supposed to know how the Spirit's working if they never see it happening in you? And you need to communicate to your children that it was the Holy Spirit leading me here. Because we need to help them be able to process this stuff in their lives. Because I'm still young enough to know that I just, I just, it's hard to know how to follow God sometimes. Young people need to know how to process these things. And they are relying on you to communicate to them how it's working in your life. But in order for you to do that, you have to be actually having that happen in your life where you're responding to that call. <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit conv convicts us of sin, we need to confess our sin, but we also need to talk about it. That God worked in my life, that I needed to forgive somebody and go to somebody. We need to talk about that with our children. Because it's important that they learn how to do that as well. It's important that at revival meetings that the parents stand up as well when the Holy Spirit is working, when the ministry does, when older people do. Our young people are watching. How are we responding? It always seems like it's, these altar calls are always up to the younger people to do the standing and confessing. I don't know. I might be wrong on that. <clears throat> But we need to be vocal about how the Spirit is working in our life. It's very essential that our children know how to respond themselves. 
and they're only going to know if you tell them. It's kind of hard to go through life picking up everything just by watching. We also need to be surrendered to the Word of God. <clears throat> we need to love the Lord with everything we have. John 14, 15 tells us that we need to love, if, if we love God, it will reflect in the way that we obey His commandments. We cannot love and disobey. Just cannot do it. <clears throat> John 14 If you love me, keep my commandments. And I pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. And he goes on to say that I will not leave you comfortless. And he says, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but you see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. We have a problem in Christian circles where we don't follow the commands of Jesus Christ anymore. That's actually been happening for a long time. Specifically, the commandments to love your enemies. Do not marry a divorced person. We are just fudging these lines now where it's like, well, that's what the Bible says, but I interpret it to be something different. Even though we can't find anything in Scripture to support our reasons for interpreting it differently, we still do it differently just because it's just, that's just the way I want to do it. And we need to teach our children that the law of God, that God is sovereign, that these, these words, that he, these commands that he's giving to us, they mean something. They are for our good. And we need to obey them to the best of our ability. Not in, a, not in a begrudging way, but with a cheerful heart. And we are, we are really fudging the rules on loving your enemies anymore. There are too many Anabaptists that believe that if a man were to attack their family, it would be okay to shoot him. That is not right. But somehow we're, just, we're, we're kind of giving up on this idea. <clears throat> I, 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 I would hate to have a draft today because it'd be alarming to see how many people would actually go to serve. We have lost the concept of loving our enemies to that point, I believe. I don't want to be an alarmist. But we're really fudging on that stuff. How do you treat your enemies? God, it says, love your enemies, bless them that persecute you, and do good to them that hate, hate you and despitefully use you and persecute you. So how are you doing with your fellow neighbor? We cannot teach our children that yeah, it is wrong for you to do this to your enemy and then turn around and besmirch the reputation of the fellow person at church and expect them to somehow get this idea that we're supposed to love our enemies. And we look at them later and say, well, what happened? We need to live out the commands of Scripture as they are commanded, as they are written. <clears throat> we are also supposed to be surrendered to our earthly authority. <clears throat> One more point on the previous, previous uh, about obeying the, script, the words of Scripture. Saul, when he sacrificed uh, to God without the presence of Samuel, and he was confronted about it. He gave his reasons for doing so. But the response, God's response was, obedience is better than sacrifice. And I don't want to take that verse out of context. But regardless of what we are doing for God, God can use our sacrifice to him. But if we are disobedient, we're not going to, we're not going to enter into eternal rest. One of the reasons when Jesus was saying in the New Testament, when he's talking about separating a sheep from the goats, he said, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Workers of disobedience. It's not about what we have to offer. And that's what I'm saying. We can, we can, we can educate our children all we want to and set them up for success and whatever. It doesn't matter what they can do. It's a matter what, it matters what they do, specifically, with the commands of Jesus Christ. 
God can use the offerings of one who is not being in obedience with him. And we see that at work where we have people living in sin that are doing good work for the cause of Christ. And we, we say, well, how can that be? God can use that work. But that work is not earning that person entrance into the kingdom of heaven. We need to instill within our children that obedience is better than sacrifice. Sacrifice is important. God didn't say that sacrifice is useless. He's just saying obedience is better. Make sure you do that before you come to me with your offering of sacrifice, your skills, and whatever. <clears throat> we need to be surrendered to our earthly authority. <clears throat> All earthly authority get their power from God. All power comes from God. Second, First Chronicles 29, 11, and 12 says, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. 1 John 4.20 says this, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. So we have this, we have this principle in place that how we interact with those around us reflects how we actually view God. If we do not love those who we, who, we, who we deal with on a daily basis, then we don't love God. Scripture is clear. And I believe that implies to everything that we, uh, every type of person that we deal with. When we are relating to our earthly authority, if we are not obeying them, and if we are not honoring them, I'm not sure how we're going to do this right here the right way. The way we relate to our earthly authority is going to be how our children relate to their Heavenly Father. I believe that, and I'm going to make sure that's... I'm, I'm going to make sure I correct on that. How we relate to our authority, our children are watching, and they're saying, they're, they're saying okay, that's how we relate to authority. <clears throat> how are we doing? God sets up authority in three different ways over us. Government, family, church. <clears throat> Romans 13 says that the government has been established by God. All powers that be are ordained of God. God has delegated his power to them. <clears throat> Turn to Romans 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works but to evil. Wilt thou then be not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good. And thou shalt have praise of the same. And dropping down to verse 5, he says, Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. And that means following the rules of government, not because we're afraid of the fine that we're going to get if we break it. It means we need to obey all rules for conscience sake, not to avoid the sake of wrath. <clears throat> In 2 Peter 2, verse 17, it says, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get this in right order, Honor all men, fear God, 
honor the king. We are supposed to obey the rules of our government. And I wonder sometimes how well we actually do with that. How many rules is it okay to break in our relationship to the government and actually still be in the will of God? And I don't want to bring up, I hate bringing up 2020, but that's something that's very close to us all. There were a lot of rules that were broken then. And I don't know where your church came out on it. I, I intentionally did not try to find out so I can speak on this. How much can we disobey the laws of our land and still be obeying Scripture? That's something I really wrestled with. At our, in, in our conference, they asked us to wear the mask. The, the governor had passed an executive order stating that we should. In our school, they asked us to wear a mask, and I wrestled and wrestled. But we are commanded to obey the rules of our government. And reputation is not a reason for not doing it. Money is not a reason for not doing it. There were legitimate reasons presented, by the way. I don't want to comment. I'm not going to go into those. But it seemed like most of the reasons that were given for not doing these things were that, well, we, they don't make sense. They're stupid. There's some kind of conspiracy here. And from what I can see in Scripture, those are not legitimate reasons to disobey our government. <clears throat> And there are other laws. And I, 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 am, I, I don't stand before you as somebody as a tain. I, coming up here, I was speeding because I was late. Um, something I had to really work on was my heavy foot. But is it really okay to be blazing around 15 miles per hour over the speed limit all the time? What about education laws? There are a lot of Anabaptists that pull their children out of school after eighth grade. And the only exception to that is for religious reasons. And I don't really see that our opposition to high school education really is for religious reasons. What about work safety regulations? Is it okay just to break them until the inspector shows up? We're supposed to obey the government. What does that mean? It means we do what they say. God has also asked children to obey their parents. And children, you must obey your parents. <clears throat> they are your authority over you. You are subject to them. You must obey your parents. We are also to obey our church. It seems like with our democratic mindset that we have somehow got this idea that church is kind of this thing where you just kind of go and do your own thing, and as long as you can stay under the radar enough, that's okay. We are commanded to obey our church. When we join the church, we agree to do it, and yet we don't. It's like, yes, I will, and then you don't. There's something wrong with that. One of it is, is you're not telling the truth. Another one is you're not obeying Scripture. Is your salvation in it? No. But your salvation is not in a lot of things. Parents, adults, we cannot expect to color outside the lines on the rules and regulations just a little bit where it makes sense to us and then turn around and somehow have the authority to look at our children and say, you need to obey me. You need to obey your teacher you need to do this, you need to do that. Because your credibility was lost when you chose to paint outside the lines. Sometimes 
our children color outside the lines like we do but it's in ways that we don't expect and it's in ways that we didn't do it if we color outside the lines with church and government we can't expect that our children to turn around and follow the rules at school you might think that school is really important you need to follow the rules at school but your child might have other ideas because they're watching you and they're seeing okay subconsciously dad and mom are kind of doing their own thing what What's stopping me from doing it here? <clears throat> and teenagers, you can't blame your parents because you're now accountable to God as well. And I, would, I don't want to place you all under guilt, but you're getting to the age of accountability where you can make your own choices. How do you view the rules at school? When the handbook says your sleeve should come to your elbow, do they... And if they don't, do you wear them anyway or do you leave them at home? How many times does your teacher need to remind you to be quiet in study hall? Are you being obedient to the authority God has established over you? God also tells us to honor those that are over us. Not only obey, honor. And the word honor, when we are told to honor those in authority over us, is means to prize, to fix a value upon. Somehow I think we have gotten a little off track with what we, how we use respect. Respect means, yeah, you're my boss, I'll listen to you because you're my boss. Honor means, I find something in, I find some sort of value in you as my authority figure. That word Honor is the same word that is used when it says that husbands are to give honor unto their wife as the weaker vessel. Same word. Fixing a value upon. Not only are you my authority, but there are things that I appreciate about, appreciate about you that you are doing well. And I am serving you because you are doing well. We are losing that as we relate to our authority, specifically in government authority. If I were to stand up here, my father is approaching 70 years old. If I were to stand up here and make, some, and, and make jokes about how my father walks as a 70-year-old, how he talks, maybe he stumbles over words more than he used to. He doesn't. But maybe he would. If I made some for joke about that, you would be appalled. And you should be. If I were to make a joke about some for elderly person in your congregation about his mental fitness... That would be appalling, and it should be. Yet somehow we take those two things and we do it about the President of the United States all the time, and there is laughter all the time. Our President is 79 years old. There is no reason that we should go on that I should go on social media and find all kinds of memes depicting Joe Biden's latest gaffes his stumbling his shaking hands to no one this stuff is not funny it is not right that we are dishonoring our authority in that way it's not right if he's not in our authority Yet somehow we feel it's okay because he's a Democrat and supports raising our taxes and gives bailouts to college students. We can just tee off on him. It is not okay. And parents, you are the ones that are teaching your children how to respond to authority and you sit around the supper table and make fun of the politicians. You are destroying your credibility. When you take your son and say, okay, son, you need to obey your church leaders and honor them. You have lost your authority. We, our culture, brothers and sisters, we have failed in our relation to our government authorities, specifically in the way that we honor them. We have got to come back to the biblical view of authority that, yes, you could be, you could be a supporter of abortion, a tree hugger, supports masks and social distancing, even when there's not COVID. That's no reason to dishonor the people in Scripture who are telling us to honor the king. 
were telling people to honor the king that would someday take their head. There is no exception in Scripture for dishonoring our authority. There are exceptions for obeying if it is not of God. There are no exceptions for dishonor. I don't care what they do. There are no exceptions for dishonor. We need to sharpen up a little bit when it comes to the way we talk about our authority. May our lives be an example to our children. They are precious. And if we fail them, if we fail in our duty to teach them the essential thing that's going to bring about their life, they're going to stand before God some judgment day. Now they have choices to make. They will choose themselves. But how terrible will it be if we spend all of this time investing in our children and God tells them, depart from me. You are not obedient and broken to me. You did all kinds of good things, but your life was not worth anything to me. May God receive the glory. God bless you for your work. It is a great privilege what we are doing. Let's recognize that and approach our <coughs> responsibility with humbleness and gratefulness that God has allowed us this opportunity. Thank you all. God bless you. Two hundred twenty-three. Number
Thank you, Jeff, for coming and sharing that. Thanks for the time and uh, preparation and then coming and sharing. God bless you for that. A lot of challenges. I was thinking about the words of the psalmist. He said one of the things he desires to do is to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. And the beautiful thing about Jesus Christ was his surrendered life that he lived. And then he told Philip, I believe it was, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And if we want the world to see God, that's the only way they're going to see God, is through our surrender in life. <clears throat> I think about this quote that I heard one time in a Bible class, and I've always struggled with it a little bit because of just the truth of it. And it goes like this, if the tr if truth will not move you, it will not change you. And in essence, it says that if you and I don't make, do not make necessary changes now, there will be no benefit to our spiritual life. So may God give us grace. That's what we need to put these things into practice so the world can see the beauty of Christ in us and in our school and our families. Just a few announcements. Brother Linford is leaving for two weeks. I paused there on purpose just to see if there'd be an audible gasp. Uh, for quite some time, I think Christian Light has been asking him to go serve on these workshops, these tours they make. And so he's doing that. The board decided that if we could find substitutes and make this work, we would grant him that privilege. And also, a little bit of the thinking is that our community has benefited so much from Christian light that it is a way we can give back in a small way by letting one of our own go and do that. And also, I'm a firm believer in the boomerang effect that if, um, yeah, if we allow Brother Linford to go do this, expand his world, it'll come back and bless us as well. Not that his world needs expanding, but... Uh, so yeah, I think it'll be a good thing for our school. So Brother Dwayne has uh, consented to go and um, take some of Linford's classes, Sister Jean as well. They're going to be shouldering that responsibility. And Nola and Hannah are going to be filling in for Brother Dwayne's room, sharing the load there. And so as you pray for the school in the coming week, weeks, please pray for Brother Linford, as he goes and serves in that capacity, and for Carolyn and the family, and also for the other teachers as they move around, and for Hannah and Nola as they substitute. We can do a lot of good things back here. I think we have tremendous talent in our community. Um, but we want God's will to be done, and we want his glory to be seen in all we do, and so we need to pray to that end. Thank you for coming again. We really appreciate the support here tonight. And also, there is a snack provided. And so, you're welcome. Everyone's welcome to stay around for that. So, at this time, let's stand and have a prayer, and then you can consider yourself dismissed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and your spirit. And we just thank you for the words we heard tonight and the challenges. And we thank you that you are patient and long-suffering with us. That you are not willing that any of us would perish. And that you want to equip us for every good work. And that your power is there to do what you would have us to do. Father, I just pray that you would help us each of us to allow these truths that were spoken tonight to move us into a closer walk with you. Father, we want your glory to be seen here in our school and in our families, our churches. And we want to reach people for you and for your kingdom and your glory. Give us grace, Father, to live surrendered lives. And I pray that the words tonight would fall on soil, that it would take root. 
and that it would yield fruit. I pray that you would bless Brother Jeff for coming. Give him safety as he travels home. And uh, continue to bless his life as he seeks your will for his life. I pray for our teaching staff here at Horizon, the moms and dads and the student body. I just pray, Father, that, again, that your will will be done in our efforts, that we would bring honor and glory to you, that we would raise men and women through these blessings you've given us to be a testimony of your saving grace. Thank you, too, for the food tonight. I pray that we would use it to your, the strength from it to your honor and glory. Bless our week. Help us to be lights to the world as we go from this place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.